the footwear and a good sports bra is probably the best <laughs> pieces of, of equipment, I would say, more than anything. Hello, everyone. My name is David Hill, and welcome to my brand new shiny, sparkly podcast, Schmoozing where I take a deep dive into the careers of some of my friends and favourite people. The podcast is brought to you by the uber cool people at 12A Studios and sitting opposite me, controlling all things technical today, is Jack Pallister. Hey Jack! Hi David. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yes, very good. Jack, episode one. Oh, how exciting. It's very exciting. How's your week been? Well, David, I've spent this week trying to get a bit fitter, um, which is difficult at the moment, as you can imagine, because of uh, the current state of the world. But um, what's helping me is the fact that I'm actually teaching uh, several women of a certain age a bit of keep fit, um, which is going terrifically well. (laughs) Well, that's good. I mean, that is keeping you fit at the same time. Uh, uh, Well, it's keeping me fit. It's keeping them happy. Everyone can have an extra glass of wine or a slice of chocolate cake. Um, And uh, it's just something to do, isn't it? Something to do. Now, I should contextualise this for our listeners um, because they might be wondering what is head of technical um, doing teaching um, dance classes? Uh, So it's probably fair to say that when you're not helping me with this podcast, Jack, you are in fact normally in usual times a very good professional dancer actor choreographer um and uh yeah all of that all of that all of the above yes i certainly have my fingers in many a pie david (laughs) well less said about that jack and more about your career and only uh very good not excellent but yeah (laughs) (laughs) more better than average yes (laughs) Anyway, and talking about fitness, what's that you're pouring over there? Hmm, that was a tenuous link, Jack, to my pouring. Um, Actually, I I thought we would mark the occasion, um, first podcast with a cheeky gin and tonic, and uh, not just any gin, Jack. This is uh, a Sussex-based gin, actually, from a village just down the road called Ditchling, Um, Ditchling Gin. And uh, an interesting fact about Ditchling, uh, Jack, some showbiz trivia, is that it was the home for many, many years of Dame Vera Lynn. Oh, was it? It was indeed. And um, I've mixed this gin with a Folkington's Earl Grey tonic, no less. That sounds divine. And a sprig of rosemary, and it is absolutely hitting the spot, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> I'm glad something is. <laughs> so... Our guest, tell us more. Well, before I uh, come on to that, David, I just want to remind everyone that if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to rate and review us and, of course, to subscribe. Now, our guest today needs very little introduction because she is the only woman to hold the World, Olympic, European and Commonwealth gold medals all at the same time. Which means it can be none other than... Sally Gunnell. Well, first of all, Sally Gunnell, um, I just want to thank you for um, uh, taking part on uh, our podcast, Schmoozing. Um, And in fact, you are my very first guest, which is very exciting. Honoured, honoured to be the first guest. Gosh, so many problems, it will come through me. You'll blame me. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, Thank you so, so much. And you're you're in esteemed company, let me tell you, because we've got, um, in series one, we've got at least one more gold medalist and um, and some show business royalty as well. So um, Fantastic. Um, no, thank you very much. And I should explain, actually, to our listeners that... Um, uh, we are Sussex neighbours um, yeah. and we've known each other. I was trying to work it out, actually. Uh, I, I think it's around seven years. I was trying to work out how long I've known you. It's certainly over five years because I can trace back your involvement in the Brighton Half Marathon. Um, but I think we first met, and I'm going to dive into that a bit later, I think through Chestnut Tree House, didn't we? Yeah, I guess it is, but seven years. Wow, there you go. But... Yeah, and, and it's always amazing, isn't it? Brighton's a small place, really, <laughs> when you're 
when we're involved in the same charity and different events and things. So it's, yeah, it's been great. So really nice. Just want to ask you, how's John? John is good. He's trying to um, get all these athletes training for Tokyo, if that ever happens. Um, it's looking more and more unlikely. But of course, I have to carry on because you just don't know. So they're trying to, to race because there's an indoor race, the Europeans in Poland. But um, the, all the races keep getting cancelled in this country. And they're having nightmares. They're racing in France tonight, actually, two of them. And they've had... They've had to go out a week early and um, yeah, it's just been a nightmare. One got sent back and then it's gone out again. It's just, oh, you know, I take my hat off to them all. Really difficult times. Um, but, you know, and he's having to keep them positive and, you know, we don't know and just keep going. Keep so going. Tough times. Now, I should explain to our listeners that, that John is actually involved in training our, our Olympic um, runners, isn't he? And, and I think um, was also a, a, a massive supporting force behind your career, wasn't he? Yeah, very much so. I mean, he was a runner himself and then uh, got injured, um, but then trained with me. So he was... And the person I'd sort of chased around the track all the time and he pulled me over the line many a time and was my backbone and um, I think he got to about you know I retired and I think he was a bit lost really of what to do um, and then started coaching when he was 40 found what he loved and he's absolutely brilliant at it he's got so much patience is unbelievable and he's so good with them um, and that's what he's sort of been doing for like the last 14 years so yeah he's been to quite a few of the olympics now and had athletes there at, you know world champs and london olympics and rio and all sorts really so he's yeah it's good and it's lovely that we're still got that around us and they still inspire the our boys as well and and it's a good positive outlook oh that's amazing and, and am i right in saying that at least one of your boys also runs well, they've all run at some point, and um, so Finley, the eldest, has got back into football now. So he was running at quite a high standard, um, and then got a couple of niggles and got into back into football, which was his first love, and he's really enjoying that. Well, when they play, uh, Luca, who's twenty, uh, hate, used to hate it and hated what his mum did, hated the pressure, and then he started running in about the last three years. So, um, and, and he's like, yeah, he's really into it now. And then my youngest is 15, and he just talks a good game. So <laughs> apparently he's going to win the Olympics someday, but I think he's got to learn. He's got to put some training in at some point. <laughs> it doesn't just happen. I love that. No, I love that. Do, do you think with, with the boys, I mean, do you see any um, genetic advantages? I mean, can you see some, you know, um, exceptional talent there with, with, with them? Yeah, I mean, I think they're all they're all talented. I mean, you know, both of us run, so they've got that natural ability. But, you know, I think the thing that they've found, you know, it's, it's hard work. And, and I suppose, um, you know, I think that's the thing I've seen when you come away from the sport and you're almost looking from the other, you see these guys training and they're so talented, but it's such a small minority of people that actually make it. <laughs> And I think that's the thing that both John and I have learned. It's like, well, how did we ever do that? You know, that was crazy. Um, you know, because they are, there's so much talent and so many elements go into it all. And um, yeah, and I think, I don't know, there's there's all sorts that go into it. I mean, and they always say that to to make, they, they did some research on making an Olympic champion. And the three things was um, how active you are as a child. So I think growing up on a farm was really, important to me uh but just being outside running around it's that sort of ten thousand hours of practice um and then somebody you want to please so that could have been my coach or my dad so they always say that there's somebody that you're not just doing it for you it's about wanting to please somebody out that's really important in your life um, and the third thing is trauma so of course you can't just install trauma can you in your own kids go on um, and that can be, you know, uh, anything from, you know, divorce of your, your parents or something. Or for me, it was my mum had a, uh, a mental breakdown when I was 15. So I think it made me sort of put life into perspective and grow up a little bit. So 
Um, and that's what they found. So every Olympic champion or everybody who's got a medal had those three things in, in common. So, um, yeah, you can't just make that happen, can you, with anybody? <laughs> no, so. but that, I mean, that is, you know, for me, that's absolutely fascinating because I think, you know, as you were saying some of those things, I mean, I came to sport very, very, very late in my life. Um, but I can, I could, I could apply some of those principles actually to my success in business, for example. Yeah. Um, w- which is interesting, you know, re- really interesting. So that's a great segue to hurdle into your <laughs> um, into your career, um, which is really the you know the the point of the the the, the conversation today. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying, you know, people that don't know your background, I mean, they know of your, you know, your fame and your medals and everything you achieved and your accolades and, and the gold medals. But you actually didn't start, start life as a hurdler, did you? No, I, I started as a long jumper. Um, I had this sort of natural spring. Uh, I used to be called grasshopper. <laughs> Um, And then I was spotted by my coach, Bruce Longdon, when I was 14. And he'd just trained Daley Thompson uh, to his gold medal. So, uh, and he was obviously multi-events. So at that point, I sort of, I think I was sort of just dabbling in the, in the hurdles and the long jump. And they were two of the events in the heptathlon. So um, I then started in his group and he sort of introduced me to all the other events. So I did a heptathlon. And then realized that I missed out on the LA Olympics by 20 points and thought that's ridiculous, but realized that some of the events were great as in hurdles and and long jump, but the others were absolutely rubbish at. Um, So we focused on the hundred hurdles and then realized I could never be the best in the world at hundred hurdles. I could, I was probably the best in the country, but I wanted more. I was hungry. Um, and he suggested the 400 hurdles and I was, I was a bit like, oh my God, that's horrid. That's a horrible event that, you know, and I think someone always said to me that, you know, you never choose the 400 hurdles, the, the 400 hurdles chooses you, it, you know, it's a killer event. Uh, people used to say it's similar to running a marathon, I run one marathon, I would say, mm, not sure it's similar, but it, they both hurt. If you get it wrong, they can both hurt a lot um and um but yeah it just i sort of had a little go and that was it it took off from there and so i didn't really choose the 400 hurdles till i was what 20 yeah i was about 20 years old i started it which is quite late really could can you remember i mean you know do you have a defining moment where you remember thinking you know yeah i this is something i can really excel at to the point where i could be world class i mean can you did that happen? Did you have that sort of moment in your life? Yeah, I mean, I was always so driven right from, you know, training in the group at 14. I, I always wanted to go to the Olympics. I always had a dream of, of winning an Olympics right from that very young age. It's all I ever wanted to do as soon as I left school. Yeah, it's quite scary, the determination and hunger you have. Um, did I ever really believe it? Probably four years out. So I won. I was fifth in in the Seoul Olympics in the 400 hurdles. And that was probably the real, the first time that I thought I've got this, I can do this. Um, up to there, it was always a bit of a process and what was the next stage? And yeah, those four years were, were pretty sort of key, but um, yeah, I just knew that I had the capabilities of, of doing it and standing at that point, it was just putting all the, all the other bits in place. I've been listening myself. I'm a I'm a massive um, podcast fan. I listen to to them all the time, and and interestingly, actually, there's a couple of very popular ones at the moment. What one with Chris Evans called "How to Wow," so he's he's his hook is is very much you know talking to people exactly like yourself that have excelled and 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 done something that is really wow in their life. And then there's another one that I've listened to, which is called "How to Fail," which is actually exactly the same really it it's talking at at it from a different angle and i just when i was really kind of looking at your career and and looking at it in a lot of detail and more detail than i than i'd done previously obviously you had that famous silver medal at the tokyo uh 1991 um championships um and I just kind of wanted to pick up on that and, 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 and sort of was interested and intrigued as to whether that was a, a moment where you 
you know, you narrowly missed the gold and, mm. and whether that was a defining moment, whether you thought actually, you know, I'm not going to let this happen again. Yeah, I mean, I think there was lots of uh, defining moments. You know, there was a European Championships where I was miles ahead of everybody uh, and I ended up sixth and that was because I became complacent, didn't think, you know, I thought I just could just rock up. Um, that was that was sort of three years out from Barcelona. And then the one that you're talking about, um, yeah, I should have won it. I wasn't happy with sil a silver, I made mistakes. And I think, you know, with all of this, it's about, um, yeah, you know, I had high expectations and I was always striving to be the best. But what I was trying to do is, is be the best that I could be. And um, I wanted to know that I'd, you know, I knew what the perfect race was or I knew what I wanted to achieve. So when things didn't go right in a race or I didn't get stride pattern or something didn't happen, you know, it, it's, you know, that's when you learn from it. And that's, you know, what, you know, after getting that silver, that's when I knew that that piece I, I was missing was the psychology piece. It was the piece around the belief in your own ability and not doubting yourself and stop worrying about the others. But, and you think, God, that, that took me years to find that. It doesn't just, you're not born with that. Well, I wasn't, and, and it's not a natural thing. And it was something that I had to go and find and work with people to have to have that belief of, you know, and how you control that inner voice and all those sorts of things, how you mentally prepare. So that's that what's that's what came off the back of that silver medal just 12 months out of Barcelona was it wasn't about training any harder. It wasn't about eating any better. It wasn't about sleeping. It was just about not beating yourself up and it was about you know having respect for yourself really and belief in your own ability and yeah and all of my races was i just wanted to be the best that i could be and that's how i dealt with the pressure that's how i dealt with expectation was you know people are still going to love you around you you're still going to get married after barcelona all those sorts of things and it was about rationalizing it and just saying all you can do is just have a go and if your best is good enough, then it, that's fine. And if it's not, it's not. And that's that's where I got to, to doing what I did, really, at the end of the day. You, you just referenced that sort of psychological element. And I, I don't know whether you remember, but um, probably about three or four years ago now, um, you told me a great story that links exactly to that point. Uh, I think it was about the Barcelona gold medal. I think so. And I might be wrong. But... Um, just to put it into context, um, you were obviously very good friends with um, Linford Christie and Colin Jackson. And the three of you kind of moved around these championships together. And I think it's fair to say, Sally, you became very close, didn't you? And they were almost like, I think you described it to me at the time, like two two older brothers that were, you know, yeah. look, looking after um, you. But you told me a story specifically about um i think it was linford christie um you weren't feeling well and um he gave a a, a, a description of what life might be like on the airplane oh yeah <laughs> well no it was um so it was the year after the olympics and um we you know and all of a sudden he was an olympic champion and i was and it was like massive expectations and all those sorts of things and um anyway i got ill uh, which about a week before and i was in the best shape of my life and i got ill and nearly didn't rock up for the world championship final and i was really doubting i've got so much to lose Linford had gone and won the the world championships a couple of days before colin had just won and broken the world record and we always used to have this thing about who was going to be over and finish first. and there was like, i was the last one of course and they're all smug and i just remember the morning of the final i mean i'd fought like mad of getting out there stopping everybody knowing and that whole inner voice wasn't feeling brilliant and he i remember just sitting down with them at lunchtime i think it was before i went out and raced that final and um and they just, they both they just said to me, you know, where, you know, are you going to be with us at the front of the plane on the way home? Or are you going to be at the back with everybody else? And, um, 
Yeah, and I just remember thinking, you know, I don't want these two to have all the glory. You know, it'd always been us three almost. And, um, you know, and I want to be part of that. And, um, you know, and it was, it was almost a little bit of like, you know, you don't just deserve all this this glory. I want a piece of this. And it, and it just spurred me on. And I think it just, you know, it was the difference. You know, I went out there and won and broke the world record and, um, you know, shocked myself about how easy I could have walked away. But, you know, him, them just having the right people around you is just is just a really important element of it. And I think I'd learned over the years that, you know, to remove yourself from negative people in some respects, sometimes you can't always, but it's very draining. And if, you, if I shared a room with somebody that's always moaning or whatever, it does reflect on you. And, and I think sometimes you have to catch yourself and think, am I that person? Am I the one that's dragging everybody down here? Am I the glass half empty element? And I think what the three of us had is that we helped each other and we were the, the, the you know, you spent hours and hours and, and we helped each other to stay up and, and we were really strong for each other. And I think that was really key. And I suppose just just to explain that to people who don't understand is that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you if you were a gold winning medalist and you you won gold then you know when you were when you were flying back from the competition on the aeroplane <laughs> it was done in a way so that for the press presumably and for, for every you know every one of us back home that that you know the gold medalists came off the plane first so they sat at the front they came off the plane first and and that's the obviously that's the first shot the press want um, and that was the yeah. trigger. That was the trigger, wasn't it? They were saying to you, you know, do you want to be at the front of the plane with us with your gold medal or at the back um, with the rest yeah. of them? And, and yeah, you know, totally. I, I just and I just think that, you know, I've never forgotten that story because I think that just perfectly explains how that mental trigger and that mental commitment can actually make the difference, can't it? You know, in anything we do in life, actually. Yeah, totally. And, and I think the other thing that they'd all decided that we were all going to come home and there was a meeting at Sheffield and they'd already decided before we had all gone out and won our medals that if we all won, we were going to rock up at Sheffield and we were going to be in gold lame leotards to run round in. And of course, uh, you know, there was that whole piece, not just about coming off the plane first and the press waiting for you, but it was also you know, are we going to go to this homecoming meeting and be paraded out in, you know, in gold leotards and you're going to be with everybody else, you know, at the back with um, just with a normal leotard. So well, they were very good at saying that sort of thing. And, and yeah, again, you know, it was it was really key words and really key elements to 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 go out and perform. And maybe some people would have gone, oh, gosh, I don't like that pressure. But it was about fueling it and it was like yeah come on I want to be part of this you know really key really key uh, it's so wonderful and 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 you still keep in touch with them don't you yeah we see them all all the time because we're still involved in athletics and watching uh Colin on Dancing on Ice at the moment he's the most talented person out he really annoys me he's good at everything yeah so I said to him the other day is there anything he can't do he can cook he can <laughs> dance he can ice skate <laughs> very annoying and yeah we see Linford quite a lot and they are you know there were some really down times together and some really up times together and, and we'll always have that between us I think and that's you know it's a special partnership for sure yeah very special can you just talk us through um the 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 day you won the gold medal at the olympics in barcelona because i think you know for for a lot of people that is you know it's 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 a dream isn't it it's you know for me that would be completely unattainable i can't think of any of any discipline where i would ever be able to win uh, you know any medals to be honest um i'm very proud of my brighton half marathon medal sally that you know um, you should be <laughs> but but yeah i mean could you talk us through that day and and the feeling and the you know the sense of achievement after you'd after you've won it yeah it's um it's a very it's a it's a difficult one because a lot of my memories are, of the actual race are from photographs and videos and, and and as hard as I try to think back but but the reason for that is because um, I put myself in a place which you know I, I mentally prepared myself which I don't you know and I went 
when the gun goes of that race, um, you know, you go into this thing which is called, you know, you, you just sort of like, you don't remember any of it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's sort of like the gun goes and you just go into autopilot. So, um, which I hadn't done in any other race and I only ever did it in, in two races, this one and, and breaking the world record the following year. And, um, you know, and I think once you, I crossed the line and I won, I, I was just in complete disbelief because that race was what I had rehearsed every single day for the last year, probably sometimes 20, 30 times a day. And all of a sudden you do it and you hit the stride pattern and you run that race, perfect race. And um, you go, is that real? Is this really happening to me? Why me? How have I done this? And all these sorts of things cross your line. And, and I describe that next piece of, you know, the, the going on the rostrum, you know, it's probably about 45 minutes later, you're, you're shoved in a little room with your opponents who absolutely hate you because you've won. Um, and you're in this room and there's somebody doing your makeup, <laughs> which is the weirdest thing and putting bright red lipstick on and all sorts of things. It's all a bit strange. And you're literally with the other two girls who absolutely cannot talk to you because you've won. And there's you with the biggest grin, but it's still in this sort of like, oh my gosh, is this happening? Um, and then you get out and you stand on the top of that rostrum. And I, I always describe it as I'm in like a cocoon and I can't get out. It's all happening outside of me. And I always used to say, I wish I had a box that I could have just put it all in because I, I so wanted to just, I don't know, just experience it for, you know, for hours and hours and, and just have a clear of vision of it all and experience. But I, I was, I don't know, I've never taken drugs. I was probably the high, I was on such a high that it was just happening all around me and, you know, the flag going up and whatever. And that's why I say, you know, a lot of my memories are of the photos of the video and all those sort of things rather I'm just, I have to dig so deep to try and think of any little thing. And then you're just whisked away and in front of all this press and, you know, your life changes from that moment onwards. And it's just the most surreal madness. And it took me two months for it to actually sink in, which I know is the craziest thing, but you know, you don't change as a person, personality, and you're still, you know, a little, you know, young girl from Essex, you know what I mean? And it was like, how have, how have I done this? And you're, I'm a, and you're not, it's, you know, and, and it, you have to sort of like, almost just get your head around it. But for two months, I was just, I couldn't, I was just like, this is just crazy life. And then slowly you, you start to, I don't know, adapt and, um, and sort of say, why not? And you deserve this, but it was just absolute madness. And, um, you know, very lucky to have experienced it. And even now I still look back and think, how did I ever do that? And still was that ever, was that me? Um, but yeah, very, very lucky to have achieved that. And, um, yeah, and your life does, it changes literally overnight and you have to learn to adapt. <laughs> well, you did do it, Sally. And, you know, I, I, I was, as you were describing that, I was, you know, I was feeling quite emotional really, because I think <laughs> it's, you know, it, 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 and you've got the pressure of the whole country, haven't you? I mean, you are, I can remember it. You're there, you're, you're obviously doing your best and trying to do your best but you've got the whole pressure, the whole of the UK is looking at you to win that gold medal and bring that back home. And, and, and you did that. And it's, um, it's incredible. And, and in fact, actually, am I right in saying you're the only woman to hold the world Olympic, European and Commonwealth gold medals at the same time? Yeah, I yeah, still am after all these years. And and I sort of, I suppose in some respects, I've, I've got the hardest one first, which is the Olympics, and then the world, and then the European Commonwealth were, were the following years. Um, but just going back to what you're saying, it's, it's funny because at the time, when in the Olympics, I didn't know what was happening back here. You can't expect it. And it was only going into the worlds the following year that you felt that pressure because... People used to say to me after winning the Olympics, oh my God, you, you sent me to bed with a smile on your face. And you're like, gosh, hang on a minute. I've affected so many people's lives. 
So I didn't realize that when I was doing the Olympics, but doing the Worlds the following year, that was on my mind. It was like, gosh, all these people want you to make them happy and, you know, and be a positive thing. And you're not, you're not just doing it for yourself, which I sort of felt I was for the Olympics. I was doing, for, I felt for the world, I was doing it for everybody else. And, and um, that, that was hard. That was, that was more difficult. And then, you know, all that, that was, you know, again, psychology of it all was just so key. Yeah, I mean, I, one of my, you know, one of my childhood memories is that is my is my mother, particularly my mother. My father would as well, but my mother, you know, love loved athletics and and would be screaming at the at the TV screen and would have been screaming at the TV screen when you when you um, when you did that in Barcelona. And um, yeah, uh, it's one of my kind of memories of my childhood really and uh, yeah I mean you have millions of people will have been screaming with her you know <laughs> I um, think that's been some of the good things of um, you know some of the work I do now is meeting so bit and people telling me where they were on that night and yeah. how many people were on holiday in in Spain or in Portugal in bars shouting at the bar, <laughs> at televisions in bars um, there was another story someone told me they were stuck in a traffic jam um, I don't know where, which part of the country, but everybody was in standstill. And you knew that everybody was listening on the radio because as soon as I won, people were shouting out their window, the horn was, was going and everybody was in this, you know, mile long traffic jam. So but everybody good. was obviously listening on their radio, which is just crazy. But that, that you know, they're the, the stories that I love now. No, amazing, absolutely amazing. Do you know I was um, I was reading in the, the there was an article in the Guardian yesterday actually um, uh, which you may have seen and and certainly you'll you'll have fully be aware of this that that in the lockdown um, uh, the lockdown has actually um, brought about almost a running revolution because we've seen a lot more people running um, and and people that perhaps had not been running for a while have come back to it and then people that have never run in their entire life um we've got people here in 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 you know in the studios that have done that um and obviously i live as you know i live on the seafront in hove so i i've seen this surge of <laughs> of of new of new runners um and and i just wondered you know whether you've got any advice for those people in terms of yeah. you know keeping it keeping it going really yeah yeah well in the first lockdown i remember looking out the window and seeing where we live and seeing, you know, first time all these people, and I think, God, I bet they're all new to it. So in the first lockdown, I actually did a run club because people were saying, I don't know how, what to do, what I should be wearing, where do I go, how do I stick with this? So I sort of did a run club, and I think it's just, it's just been phenomenal. And, and, you know, the Couch to 5K is absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, the millions that have logged into that, which is absolutely, you know, fab. And I think, do you know what? The good thing about running it is, uh, you know, we've talked about the natural endorphins and, um, you know, as you you go out and you run and you might, you probably drag yourself out of the house, don't really want to go and do it. And then you do and you've got that. But also I think, you know, it's great for your weight um, and it makes you feel good and you don't have to go and it's over and done with pretty quick and it's quite cheap to do, isn't it? So I think there's, there's so many benefits and I think it's just, I love the idea that people have found running and probably never done in their life and all of a sudden, um, you know, they're able to do it. And, and it's when I did a program years ago where we took uh, people from all sorts of different um, sizes and illnesses and all sorts of different things and I do it with Steve Cram and they ran the London Marathon and that always inspired me so I'm not saying to everybody go and run the marathon but how many of them actually did it and actually crossed the line and were just amazing and I think that's you know that just shows what running can do and um, yeah you know and I always say if you hate it don't do it but you know give it a little go because it can be quite life-changing as well now you know you said it was quite cheap Sally but I have to say that um when I first got into running you know I was just running in my general gym wear and you know just just going out there with a pair of trainers and and you know doing it in my general gym wear and then I discovered when I started doing park run at Hove Park <laughs> I then discovered Sally 
that people have got all these incredible running tights and running vests and then obviously there's the running footwear and I thought oh, yeah. I've got to have all that I've got to look, <laughs> I've got to get all that gear I've got to get all that gear and it's I think it's interesting actually as I've as I've become more immersed in the whole running environment it's quite important isn't it you know the whole you know your running shoes are quite important and the, and the technology behind those now is incredible but but sort of the aesthetic can be quite important to some people as well <laughs> i think i don't know john always says to me, oh, it's nothing like going out in a new piece of equipment or whatever <laughs> else which you know if that inspires you and that keeps you going i think that's absolutely brilliant um but you know, you can go out in your own baggy jogging bottoms and, and a T-shirt if you need to. Um, I probably wouldn't go out in your green flash trainers. That's, that's probably not quite so good. I think the footwear and a good sports bra is, is probably the best <laughs> pieces of, of equipment, I would say, more than anything. And, you know, a lot of injuries are because people haven't got the right footwear on. So, uh, you know, people often come to me, I've got sore knees or my hips hurt. And it's like, oh, well, you've probably had your trainers for about three years. Um, so I think, yeah, they're the two best. But you don't have to spend, I mean, got some of these shoes now that the athletes are wearing are so expensive you know and it's i'm not saying get a cheap pair but you know you can get a good pair of trainers uh, for a reasonable amount of money but they just you know just get it right for you and um you know try a few pairs on go to some of these shops we can't even do that can you now but uh, yes and and i always say yeah you know i still like a new new little pair of running types or something or uh Makes you, makes you get out there and maybe run a little bit faster for a couple of days. Yeah, oh, I'm a big fan of a lovely pair of running tights, um, <laughs> male running tights. Um, of course, of, of course. Of course, Sally. Do you know what? One of the things um, uh, I did yesterday in, in preparation um, for this discussion was I, I contacted my um, my friends and colleagues at the Brighton Half Marathon, and I'll, I'll touch on how you've been involved with that. Um, just to sort of say, you know, I'm, I'm having a conversation with Sally tomorrow. Have you got any questions or ideas or anything you want me to put to her and interestingly our, our our wonderful talented communications manager Katie Hiscock she actually said that when she looks through the photographs of the race because obviously the race is over 30 years old as you know uh, and has got a, a a real legacy um both in the local community and on the, the national running calendar um she sees that obviously in the 1990s there was very few women taking part yeah. in the half marathon yeah. and now we jump to 2020 2021 and it's almost 50 50 it's about 48 percent of our runners now are women and i just That's wondered right. what your what your thoughts were on that yeah i mean it is amazing i mean i think the first time the marathon was in olympics was in la in 1984 wasn't it and it wasn't you know women didn't run that sort of distance and um yeah i think it's you know it's it's people like you know paula and people like that have inspired so many people to to go out there and run and also i think you know it's um yeah, it's just grown and I think it, it does help women to, you know, to control their weight and have that healthy sort of mindset and has changed so many people's lives and, and it's and it's such a confidence builder in yourself and I, and I just love that there's so many distances, you know, from I mean, the park runs have been amazing at 5k to your half marathon, there's a 10k in between, you know, it doesn't have to be a marathon, a full marathon, there's there is something for everybody. And I think the other thing is it's the fun runs, it's the fun element. And, you know, that's the bit that I enjoy when I retired was, you know, I was actually competing with other people starting on the start line. And I got all my friends, we used to do the uh, cancer research run, the run race for life was the first runs that I did. And I absolutely loved having all my friends with me. We trained together and, you know, I'd start on the line and I'd just run with them and, um, you know, and I just loved that whole camaraderie. And I think that's why women have got into it. We found something and, and you know, and it's like with any anything, isn't it? It's always about, I don't know, the glass of wine afterwards or what I'm going to eat, you know, the roast dinner or whatever it may be afterwards. That It's probably no different for you guys as well, but that's, you know, that's all part of it. And I think that's why we're, it's, it's grown really. Absolutely. 
One of the points I wanted to get across in this podcast, because you won't do it, so I've got to do it, and I think it's important, is that, that so since I've known you, you are a person that says yes. And by that, I mean that I've asked you over the course of the years to do many things, often involving a charity. So uh, uh, as we as we know, the, the, the Brighton Half Marathon is the single biggest fundraiser for the Sussex Beacon that own the race, which which is a local charity in Brighton and Hove. Um, and it's uh, it's 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 key to them. It's key to their survival. The fundraising from the Brighton Half Marathon is is, you know, very important to the Sussex Beacon. Um, and I think you first interacted, certainly under, you know, our tenureship. I asked you to start the race, um, uh, which you just said yes to and came down and started the race and did all the press interviews. Uh, last year, I asked you for the 30th year if you'd be one of our amb- ambassadors, official ambassadors again, turned up, did the press interviews for us. Um, uh, and and the same, I know, is the case with Chestnut Tree House, which is the other charity that, that we both uh, involved with. Um, and um, I know that um, I think recently you've become vice president, haven't you, of both the hospices, St Barnabas and Chestnut Tree House. And I just wondered how important that, that, that you know, that giving back and giving your time and, and helping those charities has been, Sally. Yeah, I think it's, um, I don't know, you... You win, you you know, you win what I did and you do what you do. And then all of a sudden you are, uh, you're a voice and people listen to you and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and I think for me, that has always been around, yes, when I talk about health and well-being and being the best people can do. But I think on the other side, it's like, well, you know, being a voice for the charities. And, and I think it's, um, I think it's, what I've always tried to do is to, you know, because you do, you get asked by all sorts and I think of different things and I can't say yes to everything. So I've always tried to pick charities or to get involved with people that I'm very passionate about. And I think that's really key. And when you can feel like you can make a difference and where your voice is heard. And, um, and I think both, you know, the Brighton Half and the Beacon and the Chestnut Tree, which is my local charity that I really support and have done for a number of years. And, and um, you know, and then you can throw yourself in. And I think it's nice to, you know, to share, be able to share what they do and to try and get the story across how amazing uh, both the hospices is and, and what they do and all those sorts of things. And just very fortunate to be in, in a position to be able to do that. And, um, and I guess, you know, sometimes it's about what you get back from it as well. And I think, you know, in all these things, I think one of the big things I always say is how important it is to, to give to others. And if whether that's volunteering and doing something for others, and, and that is part of doing something for somebody else. And that, that gives me, makes me very rewarded as well as them. Yeah, but I think, you know, you, you hit on a point there where, um, you know, there are some people in life that, that in your position that would lend their name to a charity and actually often that's all the charity needs and it's, can, can, it can be very valuable for someone with a profile to lend their name to the charity and that's kind of what they do and, that, and that's as far as they go but you, to use your own words, you know, you throw yourself in and I know with Chestnut Tree House you've, you've you know, you've, you've gone abroad and done some of the, the fundraising challenges for them uh, in terms of bike rides um, and every year without fail I see you at the Snowman Spectacular and, and you know, you're there and you're up on stage and you're playing your part to try and, you know, push that fundraising on and, and you are very involved and I have the greatest respect, you know, for you and I know, you know, again, I spoke to the charity yesterday, I spoke to the guys at Chestnut Tree House and said we were doing this and, you know, it it just, the the love they have for you there is just so, you know, immediate and obvious and it's it's wonderful. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I try my best. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> um, I'm conscious that we're we're coming to an end and I've got a, I've got a couple of quick questions that I just wanted to ask you, which I think you'll be able to answer quite quickly. Okay. But I would just like to know, uh, and for our listeners, what is a well-being coach? Oh, what is a well-being coach? Um, a well-being coach is, is somebody that uh, gives the tools and uh, the information and the support uh 
for you to be able to deal with what is thrown at you in life and to help people get the best out of themselves. So there you go. <laughs> that's a that's a great answer. And am I right in saying, Sally, that you that you know you take that into the business world as well. So you've been very active in the last few years professionally, haven't you, in helping a lot of businesses, um, and particularly where the, the you know the agenda around mental health has as 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 kind of risen to the surface, which is which is brilliant because we now you know the stigma attached to that has completely gone, in my mm. opinion. But you've helped a lot of companies along the way, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, we put uh, lots of wellbeing programs together in organisations from working with, you know, mental health first aiders to um, putting very in-depth, you know, programs together that get much more of the company, uh, you know, engaged in, in what they're doing and having less health problems and all those sorts of things. So, yeah, we've been very busy. I work with a company called Camwell and we, we do a, a program called Energize You. Um, so we make real change with with companies and their organizations and their well-being programs that they put in place so I love it and I still do lots of different talks as well around resilience I'm going to do a new one on Friday around mental fitness so I'm excited to be launching that for the first time with BT on uh, this coming Friday so yeah still keeping reinventing myself keep loving what I do and maybe one day we'll get back on that stage and delivering again who knows no definitely <laughs> and and if there are as i'm sure there will be you know there are sort of directors of companies and ceos and and people from you know who are running businesses um listening to this and they want you know they're inspired by this conversation they can get in touch with you can't they through your website sallygunnell.com yeah that's it all they have to do is a contact page on there i'm all on all social medias they can uh, direct message me at any time as well and um yeah, we'll get back to them. So please do. No, brilliant. Um, one of the themes of this um, new podcast series for me uh, as an obvious theme because I've been immersed in it my entire professional life is the, is the murky world of show business, Sally. And I was just interested. I know obviously you, uh, particularly when you, you know, retired from professional athletics, you, you stepped into the world of the media, television, radio. And I just wondered what your, your favourite television experience was. Oh, gosh. Um, probably. There's some highlights and some lowlights. <laughs> the one I did was for Sport Relief. And um, I can't even remember what it was actually called. But I had to go with my doggy. And we had to do all sorts of assault courses. And, um, and she was amazing. And, um, and we, cut, we got the runner up, actually. So I love that. And it was like one of those week in, week out, we got through and uh, whatever else. But I think that's terrible. I can't even remember. Probably one of the hardest things was only falls on horses, which was, an, again, another sport relief. We had to learn how to show jump and being bucked off horses and stuff. So that was pretty dangerous. Um, that so sounds terrifying. Avoid... It was. And so I've avoided things like, you know, dancing on ice and things like that because I know I'd just yeah I wouldn't enjoy it but yeah <laughs> well actually you know that's one of my questions I was just interested you know and you never know who's listening I mean are there any of those reality programs like Strictly that you would you would consider doing well I got right down to the last one on uh, about the last week before they're about to launch on Strictly but it was trying to pair up and they needed a, another bloke um, so they put you and in instead of me on that year. So I nearly got close to how that. How dare they? Um, how dare they? How dare they? Yeah, I think he got knocked out the first round in a way. Um, but I don't know. I maybe I don't know whether I'd ever be very good at it. Uh, I've been for interviews for um, Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. Uh, but I think sometimes you have to be. With, with sports people, they want you to be that really sort of competitive evil sort of person i'm not quite sure i quite like that um so anyway who knows but yeah i watch them all and they're all great fun and i'm not quite sure how i'd get on with any of them <laughs> but you'd be open to going in the jungle sally let's just get that clear would i be open? i'd have to uh, yeah it changes every year isn't it i'm not very good at heights i would if they went back to australia and brisbane and having to do that her first scene where they're standing on those 
cranes on the top of the building and whatever. I'm not even, oh, can't even go there. So who knows? Do you know, I, <laughs> I'll tell you one of my funny stories. I, I got, and people don't believe me, but I got approached by the, the, the producers through my agent at the time to go into the jungle. Now I'm completely unknown. I have no, you know, I'm no, nobody in the world knows who David Hill is. And, and I, I didn't understand it. And it actually, I don't know whether you remember, it was the year that they, they actually put in the jungle um, quite a high profile um, agent, um, a- entertainment agent. And the idea they had actually was to drop someone that could effectively, you know, influence celebrities' careers and, ah. and, and throw them into the den with them. And obviously, we've always operated an agency from, from here. And, and so they, they um, my name was thrown into the hat, actually. Oh, wow. Um, at, at, at whether I would want to do it, because I'd done some TV pilots previously. And what was interesting for me, I mean, I don't like heights. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I can't bear heights, but I have done things like I've climbed Kilimanjaro and I've done the Great Wall for Chestnut yeah. Treehouse. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't so much that, because that, I think I would have got over that, but I am absolutely phobic about rats. I cannot, <laughs> cannot stand. I, I think I would pass out if I saw a rat come close to me. I actually think I'm that phobic about them. So, yeah. yeah. I know. I don't, oh, it's not even worth thinking about. Yeah. Um, I've got one final question before we, we move on to... Um, one of the new features of our uh, of our podcast, which is the story. But I've just got one final question, really, which is, you know, an open ended question in terms of 2021 and what you think 2021 holds for you. I mean, what you know, what what are you looking at at 2021, Sally? Gee, it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think one of the things I've found hard is to, you know, I've always been somebody who has goals and look ahead, and and I think. What lockdown then is done is to make it each day at a time almost. So I haven't allowed myself to go into what 2021 is going to happen because, you know, we've had so many things cancelled. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult. I just want people to be able to get back to a what we call a somewhat normal life and and you know I don't have massive you know, aspirations or anything with 2021 I think it's just about you know let's survival almost and yep. for people to be healthier and to have learned something from what we've been through and to come out the other side and you know, and not for it to affect us as too much. I mean, I know we've, we're we're in all sorts in, in the coming years with mental health and all sorts of issues. And I just want people to, you know, see a bit of light at the end of it and to have say, right, we've been there, done that. And, and almost 2022 to be the year that we can now, let's go again almost, um, which doesn't sound very positive. Uh, and I'm normally a really upbeat, positive, and I want to do this, but I think it is still about seeing that light and for healthier people uh, to get through and, and have, you know, let's just do this. Yeah, and, I, you know, I think if if there have been certain things that have happened during this pandemic, and I would say one of the things is that we've seen, you know, a lot of kindness, haven't we? There's been a lot of kindness, you know, shown Um and people like Sir Tom Moore, who you know, um, oh, yeah. have have just you know risen, and um, yeah, their stories have been so inspirational. So yeah, um, yeah no, I'm with you. I think I think you know we've we've got to be realistic, haven't we? Yeah, and you know, and hang on to what we have learned, and you know, I think that's really key. No, absolutely. Well, um, I'm going to explain to our listeners that um, in putting together this podcast we wanted to end it with something fun you know something and something a little bit different something that we haven't heard you know other people do uh, in other podcasts so um i came up with this idea sally that um that we could actually create a story together so the idea being that you know i'm going to start the story off and then each week our guests will continue the story with complete license actually to go wherever they want to go with the story and in fact we're going to put the story on the website as each week um, unfolds and we see where the story goes so the next part of the story um, clearly is in your hands and um, so what I thought I would do just for theatrical effect um, Sally's I'm going to I'm going to read the first part of the story which I've written 
Um, okay. And I have to say, I mean, I suppose I've I've written it. Um, my thrust has been to write almost the beginnings of a quintessential English who done it. But that might not be where it goes. We don't know. We don't know. We but don't that's know. that's how I've written it. So I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the first part of the story which I've written, and then I'm gonna let you continue with okay, with your cool. few lines, um, and um, and then we'll, we'll you know the next guest will continue after that. So um, yeah, it's just some fun I think we could have at the end of the podcast. So here goes. I'm getting into my um, into my <laughs> theatre well. actor mode uh, at, before I start. Um, I've called it The Green Door and um, and the feature is uh, Through the Green Door. So we really want to see where we go through the green door with this um, this part of the podcast. Here goes. As Henry would soon discover, the old manor held many dark secrets within its crumbling walls. The imposing house and surrounding estate had been in the Osborne family for over 200 years. And as the eldest son, he would inherit it. The green door, situated at the top of the house on the third floor, had always remained locked as far as he could remember. The children were strictly forbidden to venture up to this attic floor, but it had always proved too tempting to explore. Henry discovered the key to the green door quite by accident, when he was searching for his wallet in the old orangery. Unknowingly, he had passed it so many times over the years, and yet there it was, directly in front of him. The soon-to-be heir to the family pile knew instinctively which room it belonged to. Sliding the key and wallet into his suit's inside pocket, Henry made his way to his father's wake. He needed to excuse himself so he could finally see what secrets were so bad they had to remain locked behind this old green door. But it wasn't going to be easy. Many people had turned out to pay their respects, but Henry suspected it was mostly so they could have a nosy around the big house. Henry was sensitive to other people's feelings, something his father had lacked, which would make this job even more challenging. Reaching the main hall, Henry took a deep breath. That is so brilliant. That's brilliant. I'm intrigued to see where it goes that now. That is absolutely. I was there. I was. I was there. Jack. Jack smiling as well. Sally opposite me. He thought that was brilliant. Sally, thank you so so much. Yet again, you've said yes to me, and I really appreciate it. Um, um, you are our first. Um, special guest with schmoozing. Um, do you feel like you've been schmoozed, Sally? I do, yeah. <laughs> lots of firsts in there, which is very nice indeed. So thank you for inviting us and honoured to, to kick off your new series. So good luck with that. Thank you very much. Well, that's a wrap on my first episode of the podcast. Thank you to the inspirational and very lovely Sally Gunnell uh, for being my first guest. I'm David Hill. And this was Schmoozing. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to rate, review and above all, subscribe. Now, next week's episode is with the actress Jill Nolder, who is not only one of the stars of the hit TV series It's a Sin, but she's also the inspiration behind the story. So please don't miss it. Stay safe, stay positive and stay with me for more celebrity schmoozing next week. Thank you.